the New England Journal of Medicine just published game-changing diabetes data that could eliminate over 300 insulin injections per year. But before you get excited, there are critical limitations we need to discuss. I'm diving deep into the Quint-1 trial, what works, what doesn't, and why the FDA might be skeptical. Let's examine what could be the biggest shift in diabetes management in decades. The diabetes treatment landscape has a major problem, therapeutic inertia. Studies show that 30 to 50% of patients eligible for insulin never actually start it. Why? The injection burden is real, 365 injections per year, complex titration algorithms, and persistent fear of hypoglycemia. Only 47% of type 2 diabetes patients achieve their glycemic targets. Every day of delay increases cardiovascular complications. This is where weekly insulin becomes revolutionary, potentially reducing annual injections from 365 to just 52. So what exactly is insulin efsatora? Insulin efsatora represents cutting-edge pharmaceutical engineering, an ultra-long-acting basal insulin with a flat pharmacokinetic profile and 17-day half-life. The technology involves FC fusion, binding insulin to immunoglobulin components to dramatically extend duration. Eli Lilly designed four fixed doses, 100, 150, 250, and 400 units in pre-filled auto-injectors. The concept is elegantly simple, no complex calculations, just stepwise escalation every four weeks until you hit target glucose levels. This isn't just about convenience. The fixed-dose approach directly addresses the complexity that creates therapeutic inertia. Let's examine the key research question. The Quint-1 investigators asked, is weekly insulin efsatora non-inferior to daily insulin glargine for HbA1c reduction in insulin-naive type 2 diabetes patients? The real innovation wasn't just weekly dosing. It was the fixed-dose paradigm. Previous weekly insulin trials used flexible dosing. Quint-1 tested whether you could achieve equivalent glycemic control with only four predetermined dose levels. This represents a fundamental shift from personalized titration to standardized escalation. Now let's dissect the study design. Quint-1 was a robust, 52-week, phase 3, open-label, treat-to-target, randomized controlled trial. The researchers enrolled 795 participants across 71 sites in the United States, Mexico, and Argentina. The study included adults 18 years and older, insulin-naive, HbA1c, between 7.0 and 10.0% BMI under 45, and stable on non-insulin agents for at least three months. Participants were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either weekly f with fixed-dose escalation every four weeks or daily glargine with traditional weekly adjustments. Both groups targeted fasting glucose between 80 and 130 milligrams per liters. The study population was diverse and clinically representative. Mean age 56 years, 50% female, with average diabetes duration of 9.4 years. Importantly, 85% were Hispanic or Latino and 27% were American Indian, populations often underrepresented in diabetes trials. Baseline HbA1c averaged 8.2% and 93% were on metformin. The Efsatora group started at 100 units weekly, escalating every four weeks. The Glargine group followed standard practice, 10 units daily with weekly adjustments. One crucial limitation, sulfonylurea users were excluded, limiting applicability since many patients use these agents before insulin initiation. Primary outcome was a change in HbA1c over 52 weeks with a non-inferiority margin of 0.4% reduction. Secondary outcomes included change in fasting blood glucose levels and total weekly insulin dose at the end of the trial, as well as safety data on hypoglycemic episodes. Let's examine the primary outcomes. The headline results are impressive. Both groups achieved substantial HbA1c reductions. Efsatora dropped from 8.20 to 7.05%, a 1.19 percentage point reduction. Glargine dropped from 8.28 to 7.08%, a 1.16 percentage point reduction. The between group difference was negative 0.033 percentage points with a 95% confidence interval of negative 0.18 to positive 0.12. This easily met the non-inferiority margin, but superiority was not demonstrated. Secondary endpoints showed 57% of Efsatora patients versus 52% of Glargine patients achieved HbA1c below 7.0%. The dosing efficiency was notable, 
Efsatora required a median of two dose adjustments versus eight for Glargine. But the safety data reveals the most clinically significant finding. Here's where Efsatora truly shines. Hypoglycemia reduction. The rate of clinically significant or severe hypoglycemia was 43% lower with Efsatora, 0.50 versus 0.88 events per participant year. The rate ratio was 0.57. This is clinically meaningful. Hypoglycemia fear is the primary barrier to insulin initiation for both, both patients and providers. A 43% reduction addresses this core concern. Weekly insulin dose was also lower, 289 units for Efsatora versus 333 units for Glargine, a 44-unit weekly difference suggesting improved insulin efficiency. Now let's critically examine the study's strengths and limitations. Quint-1 has several major strengths. First, it's the first demonstration of effective fixed-dose weekly insulin, a genuine paradigm innovation. Second, the study design was robust, large multinational, well-powered with excellent retention at 88.9%. Third, the 43% hypoglycemia reduction directly addresses the primary concern limiting insulin therapy. However, significant limitations affect clinical interpretation. The open-label design introduces potential bias. The restrictive re-escalation policy is problematic. Once Efsatora doses were reduced for hypoglycemia, they couldn't be increased again, which doesn't reflect real-world practice. Generalizability is limited. Sulfonylurea users were excluded, the HbA1c range was narrow, and there was no continuous glucose monitoring data. Emergency management remains unclear with the 17-day half-life. Let's discuss clinical implications. Quint-1 results could transform insulin initiation conversations. The combination of equivalent efficacy, reduced hypoglycemia, and dramatically simplified dosing addresses primary barriers to insulin therapy. This could shift insulin initiation from specialty to primary care. The fixed-dose approach requires less diabetes expertise, potentially improving access. However, questions remain. How do we manage sick days with a 17-day half-life insulin? What about patients needing doses above 400 units? The regulatory pathway remains uncertain. While Lilly plans end-of-year submissions, the FDA's rejection of competing weekly insulin suggests scrutiny around manufacturing and safety. Here's my bottom line. Quint-1 demonstrates that weekly fixed-dose insulin can achieve equivalent glycemic control to daily insulin while significantly reducing hypoglycemia and treatment complexity. This addresses core barriers to insulin therapy and could genuinely reduce therapeutic inertia. However, we need realistic expectations. This isn't superior to existing therapy. It's equivalent with convenience advantages. The 43% hypoglycemia reduction is clinically meaningful, but emergency management protocols need development before implementation. For your practice, consider how this might change insulin initiation discussions. The fixed-dose approach could make insulin initiation more comfortable for both patients and providers. But remember, convenience shouldn't override clinical judgment. Two questions for discussion. How might this fixed-dose approach change your insulin initiation conversations with reluctant patients? What additional real-world evidence would you need before adopting weekly insulin in your practice? Drop your thoughts in the comments. I read every single one. If this deep dive into cutting-edge diabetes research was valuable, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. We're building a community of evidence-based practitioners who refuse to accept mediocre care. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next Journal Club.